Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing this morning and it is posted on our website in our archives for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both of the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So similar in your state, it might be the so-and-so state library. That's us. Um, and we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So we have shows on Encompass Live that could be for all types of libraries. Public, academic, uh, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, et cetera, et cetera. Really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, something uh, we think libraries could be doing, something um, we bring in guest speakers talking about what they're doing in their libraries. We have interviews, book reviews, uh, mini training sessions sometimes. Um, it just runs the gamut. Uh, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on to do presentations about services and resources we have through the Library Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers too from um, across the state and across the country actually. But today we have people right here local. <laughs> um, from History Nebraska, we have with us Jill Dolberg and Lindsay Hill Gartner and they're gonna talk about some of the um, cool new things happening at History Nebraska. So I will just hand it over to you guys to take it away and tell us all about it. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for having us and being interested in what we're working on these days. Um, I'm Jill Dahlberg, and I am the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, but I also have a role in collections and the digitization pro program and archaeology and conservation, so I get to kind of tiptoe through a lot of programs. Um, I'm excited to introduce Lindsay Hillgartner. She is our digital archivist, and she is sort of the architect of this whole project. So you're going to hear from me for like a minute. And then she's going to carry the heaviest load because she has built it all. <laughs> so. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all, Lindsay. She knows it inside and out. I have no worries. <laughs> do the next slide, if you like. Responsible for item number one, which is the history of digitization at History Nebraska. And she is going to talk about the digitization workflow, the overview of our documentation, um, digitization priorities, and the partnerships that we've created. We're going to talk about our in-house digitization and also Preservica and have some time for your questions. Let's hop into it. Did that skip my uh, mission slide? No, I think it's after this one. Oh. All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, we have been doing some digitization for a long time. This isn't our, our first foray into it. Uh, we started by getting some federal grants to set up our digitization lab in the late 1990s, like maybe 98, 99. Um, I wasn't with the agency then, so some of this is a little apocryphal. And <laughs> but um, we set up high-end scanners so that we could take images of particularly negatives. We got excited about taking the original negatives and scanning them at a very high resolution. And we would uh, get grants to work with various organizations like the Library of Congress or um, uh, other groups that had interest in certain collections of ours. So like for instance, um, one of the early projects that we did was to scan all of our Solomon Butcher photographs, uh, the glass plate negatives in particular, so that we could, we discovered, look inside the doors, you know, the places where the shadows lie to play with with the um, images and get, you know, the data was there. It just didn't show up when it was um, put on paper. And so That's you're, it, it is kind of amazing. <laughs> and it was, it was, this was our cutting edge moment. <clears throat> so we were able to see what kind of furniture was inside, or we could look in front in storefronts and see 
uh, what the, the canned goods lined up on the shelves and, and that kind of thing. And that was pretty exciting. So we were we were making some amazing strides there for a while. And, um, and, and then quickly, you know, as technology moves so fast, um, that kind of became old hat and anybody could do it at home. <laughs> Not quite maybe to this level, but um, it, it, I don't know, it became pretty, pretty standard to be able to look inside, I think a little bit. So we've been scanning things for a really long time. We've had um, multiple people involved in it and we scan both because we're interested and we want to make it available, but also because um, maybe somebody is interested in a particular topic for research purposes or they need it for an exhibit or something like that. You know, uh, so we haven't just done photographs over the years, but uh, lots of maps, lots of collections of um, manuscripts and that kind of thing. But it hasn't been, it's sort of been as needed. And uh, we've done a little bit of navel gazing in the last uh, four or five years as an organization. And one of the things that we realized, if you'll remember, we used to be called the Nebraska State Historical Society and we rebranded. We did some investigation, of, like, how, how aware was our public of us as an organization? And did they even know what resources we had available? And we discovered uh, a lot of people had no idea, even within the state, that we existed. And uh, and we were serving uh, you know, a goodly number of people through our reference room, but yet um, it was becoming clearer that people had expectations of being able to do research online and find the resources they wanted, for good or for bad, but it's true. People kind of want to be able to just see what's out there with a Google search. So. Uh, we started thinking about doing digitization in more of a uh, an overarching way, and for the last year have been really focused on that as a goal, a strategic goal of our agency, because the mission of our agency is to collect, preserve, and share the resources, the historical resources of our state, and um, we feel strongly that we really want to get these resources into more hands. That is the goal, and um, I think Lindsay is ready to talk about everything she's set up. Yeah, I guess your slide got deleted. I don't know what happened there. Google, you can, you can, yeah, <laughs> you can claim technology faults on that one. So, um, as Jill said, my name is Lindsay Hillgartner, and I'm the digital archivist here at History of Nebraska. I've been with the organization since. December of 2019, so if your calendars are right, right before COVID hit, so it's been kind of an adjustment moving to Lincoln um, and developing this digitization project from the middle of a pandemic, but I think we've done a really great job. So today uh, I'm going to talk about our digitization workflow and the documentation that we've created in order for us to actually get started with this digitization effort. You can't just set up scanners and start scanning. You have to have documentation and workflows to develop. So this next couple slides is our digitization workflow. And as you can see, they're very comprehensive. So I'm not going to read them to you point by point. But um, if you'd like them after, I did leave my email so you can contact me anytime. The first step is for a collection to be selected for digitization. And they uh, conduct assessment of the collection, determine the project timeline, condition of the collection, and what level of description. And we create a digital project speci specification form. Also, the word digitization is going to be said like a hundred times, so I might mess it up because it's a it's a long word. Uh, uh, digital project specification form to uh, like digi or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the digital project, uh, project specification form is really for the curators to fill out if they have collections that they particularly want to be digitized. It alerts me that they would like to be digitized, what requirements they have, what we're scanning, what we might exclude from those collections. And that would lead into step 1A, which is them to prep the collections uh, for digitization. That means removing paper clips, removing staples, ensuring the collection is stable, and really um, make sure that it's in its best form for digitization at History of Nebraska. Um, step 1B is selection work. So we might digitize an entire collection or we might just select a subset of 
of records within that collection based on you know the research needs of our um, patron base so that would be done by the curators um, is there a particular sub series and then we would have a selection spreadsheet where they'd fill out exactly what they want us to digitize so literally uh, these first couple steps are on the weight and shoulders of the curator to determine what we will be digitizing they know their collections best and what people are using um, so it's their responsibility really to set up those those steps step two is to assign um, the collection to a digitization tech and we do all of this through our project management software which is called meister task and we have currently have three staff members i'm sure i'll talk about this later but three staff members doing it part-time as long as as well as the curators are also doing some scanning um, the objects are scanned they're scanned at a 600 dpi tiff files um, stored in collection level folders on our server in a temporary server space that will then be ingested in preservica and we also do con um, conduct QC and then we ingest the objects into Preservica step four. So there are or, uh, making sure that the image is straight, making sure that it's not blurry, making sure that there's no like obstructions of the image. Those are the things that would happen in step four. And that's usually the responsibility of myself and another colleague. Step five is to apply metadata to objects. Our uh, metadata is based on Dublin Core um, and we have schemas for library materials or manuscripts and photograph collections, audiovisual materials, and uh, Jill's Shippo files, State Historic Preservation Office files as well. Um, so that is done by the scanning tech as well. And then after that, we do we conduct more quality control of the metadata to make sure that it's accurately describing the images that we are seeing on the computer screen. And then once we know that everything is good to go, we there's a tag in Preservica to make it public and then it's live for the public to see. And step seven is to delete the objects from our server. Uh, we are not maintaining any of our digital, digital images here because they're being put into Preservica, which is the gold standard of digital preservation. Our files are stored across three different locations, three ge geographic locations. Um, so they're spread far and wide and we are meeting those ISO standards. And then at the end, we just are going to return the collections back to Stacks um, and let the public enjoy what we've worked on. So. All of these steps can be happening concurrently. They're not happening all at once. You know, it's not a sequential kind of workflow, but it's really great for us to have a documentation like this showing who's responsible for what step of the project and what those action items are, because it can get kind of muddled between working, you know, different departments and different people. So with all of that said, there's also additional documentation that needed to be created in order for this to be successful. And this is just an overview list of that. Like I mentioned, the digital project specification form, properly handling text techniques for digitization. How do we, do we wear gloves for photographs? Do we not wear gloves? Those kinds of things like that. Skating rules and standards quick guide, which you can see here um, in the image. It's just giving you an overview of what DPI we need to scan things at, what our access copies are going to be, and what the scanning settings should be. Um, scanning equipment workflows. So how do you actually use the scanners? <laughs> how do you set them up? How do you make them work for you? Uh, historical resources, folder and file naming guidelines. How do you name the files? Um, that's really important because it allows you to connect it to that collection. So that was another, uh, they had them in the past. We just kind of revamped them and made them more current to what we're doing now with our mass digitization. Also, another great thing to do is have an active inventory of all of the things you're creating so that you know what you're actually creating and you're not just in a blindly knowing what's happening. So that is also being done. And then, like I mentioned, the quality control workflow, and we also needed to create copyright statements. We have three currently uh, copyright statements. We have a fair use educational claim, uh, a open, it's, uh, what is that I'm trying to say? They are, uh, the copyright is retained by History Nebraska, and then it's in the public domain. That's the word I'm looking for. So those are the three copyright statements that we'll be applying to our objects. Um, metadata schemas, like I mentioned, a metadata style guide. You know, a lot of people, this is their first time applying metadata like this. So we need to teach them how to do that. And we also created metadata type guides. How do you describe a letter? How do you describe a photograph? 
um, those kinds of things because we're doing it in a different way. So we need to teach people how to do that. And like I said, we track everything in our project management software, which is called Meister Task. And basically that workflow that you just saw in a couple slides before is replicated in this board here and everything is tracked. So we know who is working on what, when is people working on that? And this is just a screen uh, grab of someone's project board of what they're working on. And I'll mention here while you're seeing this, you know, in the previous slide too, um, it might be hard to read all of this and that's okay. Um, we will be providing you with a link to these slides afterwards along with the recording um, to the Google um, where the slides are. Yeah. Google slides, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Yeah, and just can't see things. Just... Sorry, I like talk really fast too. I, I'll try oh, to slow oh, down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with all of that documentation, documentation, we're really ready to start digitizing. And what are we going to digitize? And what is our priority? You know, we were set with a goal to digitize a million objects in the next couple of years, and soon you'll see that we've kind of went over that goal, but uh, for a variety of different reasons. <laughs> So our digital pri uh, digitization priorities are our microfilm newspaper collections that are up to 1964. That's a copyright cutoff date, and that's being done by newspapers.com, which we'll talk about in the coming slides. Highly uh, used gene genealogical records, so probate, probate records, land records, things that people really use to do that kind of genealogy research. Um, collections with strong ties to significant historical events in the state of Nebraska. The Solomon Butcher was a really great example that was um, done in the early 2000s. Um, and that's a really great historical record of events in Nebraska. Um, county and community history books, archaeology site files, and maps, because everyone loves a good map for everything. <laughs> these are just some examples of the things that we've also digitized here in these photographs. So our current totals are, for the fiscal year 2020, is through newspapers.com, we have digitized 8,413,987 pages, um, 569 pages through 1,000 pages through probate records by the records management, 74,000 pages uh, scanned, not canned, by collections reference staff, knew there was going to be an error, there always is, and then 1,741 object photos cataloged for web or export at the museum. So that gives us a grand total of 9 million and a couple change pages digitized in the last fiscal year, which wow. is really exciting. It's a lot of stuff. Um, and we're also in the midst of doing migrations at the same time. So there's a lot of exciting change happening here at History of Nebraska. And this is just a part of it. We are doing some really fantastic stuff. So this leads us into the conversation about our partnerships to get to that 9 million pages. Cause like, you know, we're a staff of five people. We can't million, you know, digitize 9 million pages on our own. So our first partnership is newspapers.com. Uh, History Nebraska stopped collecting and microfilming newspapers in early 2020. Uh, this mainly happened because a lack of space, microfilm backlog, and the digital access to most newspapers in the modern 21st century, you can get it online. And you know, our future goal might be to collect those born digital records as well, but that's the next step in the process. So we, uh, well, Jill really facilitated a working relationship with newspapers.com to digitize historical newspapers prior to 1963, 1964, housed on microfilm. Um, and these are available through history, uh, newspapers.com. And after an embargo period, they will be made available free on our website. So after a couple of years and after a little hard work of getting those 9 million pages ingested into our system, they will be made available to the people of Nebraska for free. Um, and I'm wondering, did they, what, how long is that embargo period? Do we know? Yes. So it's a three year embargo period from his, from newspapers.com. Okay. But I'm going to say that we need a couple, six months to a year to ingest all of those files into our system as well. So I'd say, you know, from the beginning to end, maybe five years mm -hmm. at the max, I would say. Don't hold me accountable. We got to get some people in here. Um, 
and scanning is projected to be completed in mid uh, 2022. I, I think we only have about three or four more shipments to send. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, I think the important thing to know about this is if we tried to do this by ourselves without them, I think this would have taken 20 years. I mean, we would we would just wouldn't have gotten it done. And um, the other thing that they're doing that we don't have to do is creating all the metadata that goes with all those pages. So that alone was uh, an insurmountable task that I'm happy to have somebody else do for us. So for us, that the trade-off of that three-year embargo was a pretty easy decision to make since we wouldn't be able to provide the same thing on our own for a really long time. And also just the money aspect, it would have cost millions and millions of dollars for us to do this. Uh, and they do it for free just with that embargo period so that they can make a little profit off of it. So it's a really great trade off um, for us uh, as a small agency of people doing this work. I think so. Um, our next partnership is we are working with the Department of Records Management. They can digitize microfilm for us. So they're digitizing our highly requested and used microfilm collections. They are currently digitizing our probate records. Um, and that will take roughly two years and then we'll move on to the next set of records. I think it will just be a continual cycle. There are a lot of collections here at History of Nebraska that are on microfilm and are only security microfilm, so they can't be used by the general public. So if we provide access to them, we're stepping beyond what was in the past of providing access of these, these microfilm reels. Got anything to say about that, Jill? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did I miss anything? <laughs> um, and with that in mind, we turn to in-house digitization. And currently in-house, we are digitizing manuscripts, photographs, and library collections. Um, digitization is being done by three staff members part-time. Uh, they also do reference inquiries as well, as well as the curatorial staff are also doing scanning. We hope to recruit volunteer student and SOS staff to, and interns to supplement our in-house digitization to get those numbers up. Um, but you know, COVID, so we're transitioning to getting more staff members in. So currently we have five flatbed scanners and over uh, with the additional, we can set up another four or five stations as well if we need to. An overhead book scanner and a large format scanner that can do maps. Uh, it's like a roll top scanner. Um, these are just a couple of pictures of our digitization stations. This is kind of showing you the four that we have in the corner in the reference room with those uh, Epson 1200 XL. Those are the main scanners that we use. This is showing our overhead book scanner and then a roll top scanner here as well. So we have the capabilities of doing digitization and we have done a really great job in this last year, but we hope to increase this with um, getting some more bodies in the building. And all of this leads into like, oh, we did it. We digitized all this stuff. Now, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> what are we going to, how are we going to get it to the public? And that leads to uh, Preservica. Um, what is Preservica? Preservica is a cloud-based digital preservation software with a user front end. Um, Preservica will ensure that our digital content is preserved into the future while providing access to users across the world. And it replaces our past perfect instance for digitized content, including manuscripts, photographs, and audiovisual. Our uh, museum object photos will stay in past perfect because past perfect is really a museum software. It's not really meant for archival stuff. So that's why we're making that description distinction. Um, and in July, we are beginning our migration into archive space, which is a collections management software for our archival collections. So that's where our findings will be stored, those collection level records for our archival collections. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of migrating and a lot of digitizing happening in this building all simultaneously at once. So it's really exciting. And this is just a screen grab of what uh, our instance of Preservica looks like. And I can show you that. So this is the back end of Preservica. Um, like I said, it really replicates a server space, but at a higher quality for preservation. It's running all of those checksums for you internally within the system to make sure that the files are stable. 
It's also diversifying where our files are stored. Um, it also will automatically change formats if a format becomes obsolete. It will change it to its proper format so it's stable. So it's a really great software um, and it's all cloud-based. So we don't have to have servers in-house and maintain those servers. It's all up in the cloud. Um, so we broke it down by the collection type. Um, and of course it's timed out because I had it open for a while. <laughs> so let me, you can all see my cats. <laughs> <laughs> stereotypical librarian here have cats um yeah. so these are broken down into those collection types like i mentioned uh, we'll click on manuscript materials so and we'll view these in a grid format. So kind of just list the collection and then within the collection, they're the subfolders within that collect that actual. So it's basically replicating what that manuscript collection looks like or that photograph collection looks like in its boxes and on a computer format. And then there are the, ob the actual objects themselves, which we can look here. And then we can download an access copy. It creates an access derivative automatically for us, uh, which will be that 300 DPI and people can download that themselves as well. Um, and then we also can download the preservation copy as well. And then this is where the metadata is applied. I'll take you back there in a second. And then here is the object. It hits natural format. Nice. And like I said, we'll go back here. And this is where that metadata uh, schema is implemented and then people describe it here. And let's see if I can remember. So the front end is actually just WordPress, which is really exciting. Uh, it's super easy to use. Yep, um, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this is what live right now on the history. It's not live. Yeah. Uh, it will probably be live in a couple weeks. We just need to finish some of the searching features and indexing, and then it should be ready to go. But this is what the public will see. They will be able to click what kind of collections they want to look at. Uh, most viewed objects as well. And then we provided some other links and then they could also just browse the collection as well. So we'll click that and they're like, okay, I wanna see a manuscript collection. I don't know. And then it lists every, so what you saw on the back end, this is what you're seeing in the front end of this. And they, um, so let's see what we can click on. Okay, here we go. So all of those records that came out of our past perfect instance were ingested into uh, Preservica. And then this is an actual record for a digital object in Preservica. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can make it full screen potentially. You can move the metadata to the top to the bottom. Um, but it's pretty great. It's a great software for um, preservation and that digital access as well. It is very oh, simple. Yeah. Nice preview of this before it goes live. <laughs> yes. Um, like I said, we're just really figuring out the um, search features and then it should be ready to go to the public. But we got library materials in here. So this is some um, maps that were ingested from our past perfect instance. We'll just click on one. So this is a compound object. So that's why it's in this viewer here and you can enter full screen. And probably since I'm sharing, it won't let me like actually show you the full screen. <laughs> But um, you can zoom in. 
really get in there. So it's pretty great. All right, let's get back to the slides. So we're really excited about our um, Preservica instance, and it will really just help um, make our collections more available to the public. And that's all I've got. I felt like I just kind of rambled, but <laughs> now we have time for questions. <laughs> oh, no. Um, yeah, I was going to say, if anybody does have any questions, definitely um, get them typed into the questions section of our GoToWebinar interface. I'm just bringing up the screen here for myself. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. We've got two different people ask the same questions in two totally different places. I want to know, is the text of the documents and manuscripts and articles searchable? Uh, it depends if they're typeset. We will OCR the ones that are typeset if they're handwritten. Obviously, we can't make those searchable because they can't be um, OCR'd, but uh, we're working on getting those searchable. That would be more of a multi-step process. To... Uh, if they're handwritten, really, it would take a transcription project for those to get um transcribed uh we can't really use computer optics to do that because there's so much variation in handwriting that that's not really feasible mm -hmm. awesome all right so that's answer to the question all right uh let's see here um all right i'm just seeing you getting other things are coming in yeah keep typing in your questions we've got plenty of time here um to answer any questions you might have um all right this is a long, um oh somebody wanted to know about an approximate date for going live with the interface but you were saying it's a couple of weeks i think yes yeah i'm sure there'll be a social media post about it so just keep checking our channels <laughs> yep yep absolutely keep Keep your eyes open for the anyone has been part of a migration you give it a date and then something happens and then you have to figure out the bugs and kinks so yeah hard. there'll be you know, announcements from history nebraska so look look on their website for following um i believe they you guys have yeah on facebook and twitter and it looks like you guys have an instagram as well i'm looking and um on the website so yeah Go to history.nebraska.gov and you can find out all of their um, various social media places. Um, yeah, there's a long question here that I'm just trying to read through, but while that's happening, I'm grabbing some quickie one here that you might be answer. Oh, someone does wonder, and it's something I don't know about this. Have you considered um, automated text recognition, ATR, for converting the handwritten text? Is that something? Um, no, because it's time intensive for like a person to do that. With the OCRing, we can just do it through Preservica itself, um, and it's just an automated system. Uh, but it right now we're just trying to get our feet into it so that might be an option in the future right yeah yeah specifically for the handwritten text where the computer would convert it that there is i guess automated text recognition is something that could do that yeah yeah something sometimes to... that's not very accurate either though uh so it's hard. Yeah. yeah <laughs> they're working on it um Oh, okay. Um, so there's a multiple questions here that I'm looking at. Um, all right. So uh, first, has newspapers.com digitized all of the newspapers that um, History Nebraska held? No, so it's up to 1963-64 from when we started. Um, so anything post that date, they won't be digitized for copyright reasons. Also, there are large conglomerate, I shouldn't say conglomerate, but large newspaper publishing houses that retain the copyright even for those older newspapers um, because copyright for newspapers is a tricky law. And so um, the person who works at newspapers.com evaluated all of our collections and contacted the publishers. Some of them agreed to digitize them, some of them did not because they're money makers for them. 
So, you know, you might not see your town because of who owns the copyright to that to that uh, newspaper. But we are digitizing whatever is safe to the copyright uh, to digitize. Hmm. So is there a way for library public libraries to identify whether a specific newspaper has been sent to newspapers.com? Is there some way for us to know which ones are in there? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, you can look on newspapers.com and if you don't see yours and I can tell you, I can't remember exactly what letter, because we're going in alphabetical order, obviously, I can't remember what letter we stopped at um, in our, with our last shipment. Uh, I think we sent through Pender. Pender, okay. <laughs> so you can always just email me and I can email my contact at newspapers.com and um, he will tell me he has all that knowledge of like why we weren't digitizing things or why there was an embargo on certain things so just i would just say reach out to me and we can get we can answer those questions for you yeah sure um we always have those reels by the way you know so if you're interested in something that happened in 1973 you can always interlibrary loan the reels from us we'll we'll be happy to send them out uh if we don't have them digitized yeah they will be still in our reference room yeah so you know the reels aren't going anywhere we're, we're going to keep those forever okay so going so the microphone going all the way back or just to the 60s yes we will maintain the microphone okay so libraries could still borrow from you guys for free to get the microphone yeah to look at certain um dates or issues or um we won't send out microfilm to we'll do it through interlibrary loan but we won't send it to libraries for them to have digitized or for them to have microfilms because that's like a third party taking those materials that are, are technically ours mm -hmm. um so we'll do interlibrary loan but not that next step of sending it to somewhere else to be digitized because right. we have no control over that yeah, because you're doing some of it local and then newspapers.com is doing some of it. Yeah. Um, so, I, of course, as I'm sure you guys have heard and known, some um, libraries across the state are um, have questions and concerns about this big change to newspapers.com um, because they have been working on, there have been digital newspaper um, project, dig, newspaper digitization, is that word again, um, projects going on from um, uh, different libraries and universities um, across the state. Um, that libraries have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this or have, have had grants that we've given them to do some of this. Um, and now it seems like this is being now duplicated and these things are getting put into newspapers.com. Um, did I mean, were you aware of the different um, projects that were already going on across the state where local libraries or universities were doing some of this digitization already? Sure. Or I mean, is this a duplication? Yeah, we were definitely aware. Um, like I said, I've been here since December of 2019. Uh, I'm aware of, of these projects that were happening. This is just another way to serve our patron base, uh, getting these things out there. Um, more resources, I think, are better than, you know, limiting what is out there for the public um yeah i don't know what else to say <laughs> sorry and do you know now uh, has what do you i mean you might not know this what is the cost to access these newspapers at newspapers.com until after the embargo and when it's free i do not know that sign up for that I, it up. I think it's like eight dollars a month I don't know if there's a special um, license for libraries. I, I didn't see any evidence of that. It looks like it's pretty nominal. Um, so that's like an individual subscription license uh, or an individual thing or a, a library? To see online. There, there are levels, of course, um, of, of membership and, in, and they provide different levels of access to newspapers. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how they decide what gets on some you know like publisher level <laughs> of um, access but <clears throat> it's it's a fairly reasonably priced thing mm -hmm. and so in three years we planned it well three five whatever it takes for us to actually 
ingest it and make it surgical. We plan to have it available for free. So it's not uh, a cost that we think that anyone will have to bear for very long. So this is like a one time, I'm just thinking this through, this is kind of like a one time big project. Everything's being done by them right now. But then in, like you said, the three to five years, everything will be free and then it's it's over. I mean, that's it. Then it's all, it's the whole thing is done or does they, does it then move forward? You said this is up to 64. Would they then start doing ones that are, you know, the next year's like 65, 66? I don't know how that all. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I, I think that it, it it keeps moving on. So I imagine we'll we'll keep sending the next sets in order to keep staying, keeping in pace with what copyright is, you know, year is up to. Oh, as it's moving forward, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> um, but you probably should know that um, since we're no longer collecting newspapers ourselves, if your uh, town has a newspaper and you're concerned about anything that has been printed up till, uh, uh, we, we have a bit of a backlog too. So let's say 2012 maybe, um, you might want to consider how to keep those copies, current copies of newspapers and, and figure out what to do with them if, if paper copies are a thing for you. Um, we think that we're going to be able to acquire most things electronically because it's you now so much so many newspapers are born digital um but we're kind of a ways from figuring that out so um if that's a concern you might want to think about it as your own personal libraries and how you take care of your community's resources right and we have a comment here. Someone says newspapers.com doesn't scan like the original newspapers, like the actual paper. It's only microfilm. Yep, true. So true. They only if something's already been put into microfilm. Can, will they yep. do anything with it? Yep. Yeah. True. Um, and let's see. Any publishers are looking for some sent copies? Okay, and then we have another comment from. Um, This is Cindy talking about it, that newspapers.com will not be scanning any community newsletters. So if your community has a local newspaper, um, more of a local thing, and it's still being sent, uh, you guys are still in your city is still sending a complimentary copy to History Nebraska, you'll still be retaining that, those more locally published. Right. Yeah, like newsletters. Yeah, newsletters. So, so mm -hmm. things that are more, yeah, not like having official like you said um publishers who own the copyright of a newspaper is a little bigger than <laughs> the locally done things so those smaller as, locally yeah so as like you know uh we move forward a lot of newspaper smaller newspapers are being bought up by these big companies mm -hmm. um so unfortunately they retain their copyright a lot for those things so that's just the name of the game, unfortunately. And sometimes you and these, and I know, and I know we've dealt with this with giving grants to libraries over the years for digitization of newspapers that, and you mentioned at the very beginning, that whole copyright thing is, it's really sticky. And sometimes even the library and the people at the newspaper themselves weren't really sure who owned Oh, officially owned the copyright and had the authority to say, yes, so and so library can scan this, it can digitize this in this community, and we are giving you that permission. Um, sometimes they weren't even sure they were the ones allowed to give that permission if somebody had been bought by someone or, or ownership had transferred hands. It was, yeah, there's been a lot of tracking back through what yeah <laughs> yeah that's why i think copyright law is one of the gooeyest laws because you can really like step in it and mess it up but also like get out of it <laughs> because people are just like it's all based on like intellectual control of who owns what um and there are legal documents obviously that relate to copyright but um you know that's why we're making that fair claim educational use just because we cannot spend the time to feasibly go and find the copyright of owners of these things that have been donated to us. That is a long, tiring process that I have done in my past. And it's not fun. <laughs> we always put that on to the libraries who are applying to us. Yeah. <laughs> we can't figure this out for you, but we can tell you, you need to know, and you need yes. to say something to us from someone that says, I am a copyright holder, as far as I know, and I'm approving the fact that they do this thing. And then, mm -hmm. 
legally and hopefully no one will come out of the woodwork and go to some little tiny little town and say how could you how dare you do this <laughs> um so we do have a couple other questions here i think i got through everything from that um those first one there um so you so some of these newspapers and microphone being digitized could be um so you 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 and or newspapers.com may be digitizing things that other organizations have already digitized themselves as well perhaps so if one of our universities or libraries has done it but and you guys also happen to have microfilm you're also digitizing it to have it in your in newspapers.com and in your collection okay yeah uh a lot of those grants from the university they were using our microfilm anyways to digitize so mm -hmm. i mean we're just digitizing it too your own yeah doing it as well mm -hmm. yeah and i understand you know people libraries are you know they've been spending years to do this but they had the grants and we're doing it and now as history in nebraska you are doing it for your purposes as well and um for what you have have this deal with newspapers.com now if these or libraries have already done it this does not negate their ownership of whatever they've done and what they can no. No, this is not saying just because newspapers.com now has it, that's where you have to go to get these newspapers. No, 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 no. This is just the, our avenue of us getting our stuff digitized. Right. So if a library has already done this, university has already done this, and you're already offering it for free, that's perfectly go, fine. Go for it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and here at the commission, we will still give grants if someone does want to do some a local project that's... Um, this won't stop us from doing that if you want to do something as as jill Lindsay said there's going to be that delay that embargo period and it depends too as you said this takes a lot of work to do these projects too so you got to kind of balance that um do you want to just wait three to five years for history of nebraska to have it available or do you want to do something do you have the staff and the time and can you get the grant to do it now yourself maybe in the next year you know you've got to kind of balance those two things out yeah um, here's a totally new question <laughs> that um, will records from closed churches be scanned if they are already microfilmed so this is a whole different con topic not newspapers so church records um, I think that they are heavily used you know, if they're identified by our person who is the curator of that as heavily used we will digitize if we have the original. I would prefer to scan the originals because microfilm is obviously a copy of a copy um, or copy of the original. Uh, so that might be a project in the future. Mm -hmm. So that would be something to yeah, reach out to Lindsay and say, we have the actual paper yeah. to get it to you to have it scanned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is not part of the newspapers.com. This is a whole different thing we're talking about here. So none of the, it has to be on microfilm, only newspapers have to be on microfilm, newspapers.com to do it. Yeah, so, no, no. Uh, we'll do anything. <laughs> Cause you've got, you've got those pictures, scanners there that you can take anything and lay it in the bed there and go for it. <laughs> yeah. I should say that as a caveat, we don't take things for loan for copy. We would have to hold the ownership of those materials um, just because just getting a scan copy is not actually retaining the record. Um, but so they would like donate a copy of it, of, like if they have multiple copies of a church records, they can yep. donate a version of yep. it, a copy of it to you guys, and then have. Yep. Yeah. I do know we have a lot of church records here that could be potentially on the digitization list. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Any other questions? I think I got through everything. Oh, oh cool. Another one came in. Um, do you have any questions? Go ahead and type them into the question section. We still have a minimum 10 minutes to go here, but um, if any of you have ever attended our show before, you know we don't cut off right at 11 a.m. <laughs> um, as long as you have some questions or links and you'll need to get information to you, we will um, keep going. And um, if you do need to leave right at 11 a.m., that's fine. We record the whole show and you can always watch it later. Um, but we do have a new. Um, Okay, so how do we know if a newspaper is in the digital collection? I think either yours or newspapers.com. Some small town papers only existed for just a few years. I guess it just. Uh, we have on our website a newspapers index 
a newspaper collections index that lists, I'm, Cindy can also chime in and make sure that I'm not misrepresenting, but I'm pretty sure that lists all of newspaper collections that we have here at History of Nebraska. Um, and if it meets that requirement of that time frame, then it's being sent to newspapers.com. Okay. I do know that we, when we were packing newspapers, there was like newspapers that only lasted a year and it's one reel and we do, we do send those kind of small newspapers. Or they change names. Oh, well, we would send those too. Well, that's always fun. Let's not even. Yeah. <laughs> in, in periodicals in a library, I, I have PTSD about that. But yeah. <laughs> um. So, but this would also be the whole 64, 63, and earlier is over in there. Yep. In there, yeah. Of any of those, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Do you want to um show on your website where like um share the where they can look this up just so we can see. Yeah. So, okay, we'll go to our website. Then you go to collections and there's this newspaper finding aids. Cool, okay. And from there, it gives us a list of all of the microfilm. All right. Um, those are, I think there's another. newspapers indexes and it's a excel spreadsheet that you can just download yourself oh, okay this is not a listing of digitized newspapers uh so it gives you a format a list of what we have that's not related to this but here we go so yeah it tells you Notes, column number. Oh, cool. Okay. And then where you can actually find it. And Cindy, mm -hmm. did, um, Cindy Drake, also from the Street of Nebraska, did confirm. Um, yes, we have online the inventory of all the newspapers we have on microfilm, even if we did not microfilm them. Which is this? You can see that here. If there's anything that's been. You know, being in a library and archiving, you know, you collect things from all sorts of places. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. Um, let's see, what's this one? Um, okay. Here's another question. If we microfilm newspapers that they're not collecting any longer, do you want copies of those rolls? So if, some library is micro has their own is doing their own microfilming of newspapers. Do you want them to send you copies so that you can also have them in your collection? I suppose. I am not the curator of those records. I think we'd have to defer that to the person who manages that collection. What do you think, Jill? Probably the right protocol thing to say. But I will say that's a lovely offer, and I we'd be happy to consider that. Reach out to Jill. We have a yeah, we have a collections committee that meets um, to discuss collections that we want to bring into our agency. So those would probably have to go to that review process. Okay. So reach out to Jill and let her know what you've got, and we'll, you'll talk. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah. And here's our emails if you'd like those. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. There's contact info yep. for me and Jill. If you guys do have any questions, anything you want to know more about the newspapers um, or anything history Nebraska, of course, because we're talking about everything that's going on. And um, and any of the documentation that I listed, I'm I can share across too. Um, I love to share. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Cindy says that oh, what you're we showing wasn't what we were looking for. There was a PDF. Um, inventory. I sorry. I um, go back to the PDF inventory. What you were showing is only of old inset indexes. So maybe the first thing you were looking at was yeah the PDFs. Yeah, she said that's Thanks. what the question was asking about. Yeah, so those would be okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I just saw the 2017, and I thought that related to that's probably the year that it was created. The finding it was created. So that's where you can look and see what is, and then search the PDF for the, uh, the paper you're looking for. Mm -hmm. 
see what's in there. Yeah. It is pretty amazing. You don't really realize, I think, yeah, that there's so much that is in there. I mean, those PDFs are huge. The spreadsheets are huge and all the detail and being an archivist and collecting these things and, and keeping them organized. And uh, we thank you so much for doing that. <laughs> Uh, and I hope I hope people will be more, you know, aware of what is there in history of Nebraska. And like you said before, you did your your rebranding, um, being the yeah. And now I can't even remember Nebraska Historical Society. I can't even. <laughs> what we State. were before, the Nebraska State Historical Society. Right. I almost got it right. Yeah. Um, which you would think would be pretty obvious that that's what you're there for and what you do, but yeah. Obviously well, people you know, what we found is that um, people hear the word society and they think that means that you have to be a member in order in order to oh, okay. emulate it from us. And uh, it, it just it, it was a barrier that strangely, um, you know, <laughs> would cut people off before they'd ever contact us. So weird. OK, yeah. So we just kind of kept the two words that were the most. <laughs> most salient for this. Hopefully it makes it I mean it's it's just it's history Nebraska for history. everyone. Don't look at it. <laughs> Absolutely. All right we're getting close to 11 o'clock and it looks like the questions have um, slowed down. Anybody have any last minute desperate questions you want to ask of um, Lindsay or Jill? Get them in right now and we'll get them asked. Um, You had lots of great questions. We're grateful. Thanks for being engaged with us. Oh, well, we had quite a good group here. I know we had a lot of people signed up for today, uh, people from across the state. Um, just wanted to know, yeah, what's going on? What's going up new for Mr. Nebraska? Yeah. All right, I'm going to give another. I can't see if you guys are actually typing in, so I have to wait until you're done and it pops up and lets me know. <laughs> um, I am going to pull presenter control back to okay. my screen now to wrap things up here. And I do have here, um, I was looking at myself here, the History of Nebraska website um, here, um, which we have linked from the session page for today's show. This doesn't look like any other questions are going in, so I think we'll wrap it up, yeah. Um, the show has been recorded. So, so thank you so much, Jill and Lindsay, for being here and sharing with us. Um, definitely keep an eye on the website. Uh, as I said um, earlier, if you want to know, I know people are very interested in when is the new search going to come out. And I scrolled all the way down here, at the very bottom of the page. They got a Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter. They have a newsletter. Sign up for the newsletter. Um, so reach, you know, keep an eye on them in all those different places where there will be announcements of when um, everything is the new search. What is it called? Yeah, we're going to be pretty excited. We're going to make some noise about it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And I'm sure we'll share about it from here. I know I will once I see. I follow you guys everywhere. I follow History of Nebraska, I mean, on all the different Awesome, yeah. thanks and everything so yeah sign up for all of those and to keep an eye and know what's going to be happening and when it is ready so um that'll wrap it up for today's show um as i said it has been is being recorded and this is our main page encompass live if you use your search engine of choice and just type in encompass live we're the only thing called that on the internet so far nobody else is allowed to use that name <laughs> Um, and you'll find our page our upcoming shows are listed but uh at the bottom here is our archives link and this is our most recent ones at the top of the page here of all of our archives. So today's show will be at the top here. Uh, when it is ready and posted, uh, I will email everyone who attended today and everyone who registered for today's show. Um, should be done by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest, uh, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. I'll post it up here. I'll also post a link to the slides. Um, Lindsay, you can just send me that sharing link when you, um, whenever you have a chance. Um, any corrections or additions you want to make to it, you're welcome to do too. I know you were talking about. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's great about the Google slides. You can always fix things. And it, it yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and while I'm here on the archive show um, page, I will show you there is a search feature here. If you do want to look up and see if we've done a show on any particular topic or had any particular speech, 
speakers. Um, you can search the sh full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something really current. Um, that is because, and I'm going to scroll down a bit here, you can see the dates go back back here. I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom. This is our full, full <coughs> excuse me, show archives going all the way back to the beginning. And Compass Life premiered in January 2009. So we do have the over 10, 12 years worth of archives all here um, on our YouTube channel. So um, be aware though when you are looking at any of watching any of our archives just pay attention to the original broadcast date all of them have a date so you'll know when they took place uh some of the information um may be may stand the test of time but some things will become outdated um services and resources may change drastically from when we first did the show um, not this anymore. links may be broken uh, you never know so just pay attention when you are watching our archive uh, um, broadcast um, but we will always have these up here as long as we have a place to host them um, as you guys do at history of nebraska we do librarians what we do is we keep things for historical purposes and as long as we have the ability to we'll have all of our full show archives out there for everybody to watch um we do have a we also have our um social media we do we have a facebook page um if you do like to use facebook eh, uh, you can give us a like over there. We give reminders about our show. Here's a reminder to log in today's show about our speakers. When recordings are available of other show, of previous shows we post on here. So um, if you'd like to follow us on Facebook, you can do that. We also have a hashtag that we use, NCOMP Live, a little abbreviation of our show name on Twitter and Instagram and wherever else our social media people put it. So if you like to um, look for that hashtag there. Um, also our mailing list we have here through the Nebraska Library Commission. I announced through those, um, the system mailing list every week, what shows we have coming up. So if you like to keep an eye on things there. Um, and that I uh, hope you'll join us for um, we have our upcoming shows all listed here and next week I hope you'll join us it is part three of our teaching technology in the library series Amanda Sweet our technology innovation librarian has been doing this um, we've got part three next week and part four the last Wednesday of the month and next week we'll find out about finding partners and preparing staff uh, the first two set, um, parts are record are have been done and the recordings are up who is learning and why and how do people learn so if you want to watch those first before you jump into next week's you can um, so please do sign up for next show and join us for any of our other future shows on encompass live thank you everybody for being with us this morning thanks lindsay and jill and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of encompass live bye-bye <laughs>